Um, so thank you all for coming to the session today. Uh, my name is Stuart Lynn. Um, I'm here talking um, mostly on behalf of um, Dylan Hoppen, um, who I work with daily at the University of Chicago. Uh, he was meant to be here to give this talk, but unfortunately he couldn't make it. Um, so I'm giving it in his stead, and we've coordinated over the content and everything else. So I just wanted to give a big shout out to Dylan, who's an awesome developer, and um, he's really sad he couldn't be here. But hopefully this just will be really interesting. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about WebAssembly. Um, we were expecting there to be another talk after this one on WebAssembly as well, and so I was coordinating with that um, uh, like presenter. They were going to go into a lot more of the technical detail, but we're not entirely sure if they are able to to make it or, or present today. So um, this is going to be kind of fairly introductory, kind of for people who haven't really heard of WebAssembly before, or you haven't used it in a project before, kind of a, an, an idea of like what the space looks like. Um, but if you want to know any technical details about it, um, come and find me afterwards, and we can chat because they'll be interesting. But we're going to be talking about um, kind of interest and use cases, why you might want to be uh, interested in WebAssembly, about WebAssembly itself, what it is, what it does, how it works, and then we're going to be talking a little bit about a use case that we have that we're building out for WebAssembly and kind of go into details about how it enables us to do things that are a little bit hard to do just now with like just JavaScript and HTML. So a little bit of an introduction to myself and Dylan. We both work at the University of Chicago. Um, uh, we work part, half at the um, Healthy Regions and Policies Lab and half at the Spatial Data Science Center. Um, the Healthy Regions and Policies Lab is a lab at Chicago that is interested in understanding how place drives, interacts with, and influences health for different people in different ways. Um, they explore this through looking at neighborhoods as complex systems with spatial signals that help decode their stories. Um, and the, the department does a lot of um, really interesting work around social determinants of health, so how your built environment and where you are affects your health outcomes. Um, COVID-19 mapping is part of that, and over the past couple of years, really trying to understand the patterns that exist in COVID-19 data as they're happening. Um, air quality and how that affects health in cities, most notably Chicago. And then uh, in the States, looking at a lot of opioid risk factors. So the huge opioid epidemic in the US is uh, you know, a, a horrible tragedy, and it's one that's very spatial as well. But you look at the data from it, it's distributed in, in, in ways that are spatially um, sort of you know, significant. And so the, the, the lab tries to do a lot of that work with um, researchers, uh, community advocates and kind of like anybody who's kind of interested in solving these problems. The Spatial Data Science Center um, is a center which um, looks to develop state-of-the-art methods for geospatial analysis. We do a lot of spatial econometrics. Um, Luke Ansel was the founder of the lab. He's one of the kind of the grandfathers of spatial econometric methods. Um, and so sort of the lab tends to try and build out these tools to, to sort of address those problems and use them in different contexts. The main piece of software that's released by the lab is called Geoda. It's a library um, which has uh, got bindings for C++, SQL, JavaScript, Python, R, and JavaScript again. I don't know if it says JavaScript twice, but it's in there twice. Um, and you can use it to like do spatial econometrics models across the whole different um, like bro like broad spectrum of data. Um, we tend to build applications, as I said before, for people who are researchers, community organizations, and these are people who tend to have not very much money to, to run systems or to keep them alive and maintain them. And so what we do is we tend to try and build tools and dashboards and applications with a mind to that. So we build them in a way that's very, very focused on um, keeping costs down by doing as much in the browser as we can, having static data sets that like, we prepare ahead of time to be very efficient, and pull in at runtime. So we, we have very little back-end infrastructure for the projects that we build as a way to keep things um, both extensible and maintainable for the, the partners we, we work with. So a really good example of this is the US COVID Atlas. This is a project we started, um, obviously, about three years ago now, looking at COVID data. Um, it's all run in browser, so the COVID data for every US county is generated every day, is packaged into a protobuf format, which is really efficient to store and to, to access. And then when a user comes to the website, we pull that data down and we visualize it in a number of different ways to give them insights as to how the COVID crisis is affecting different communities across the US. It's all open source, you can check it out online. It looks like this. Um, there's a lot of different tooling and a lot of different functionality in it, but the one I really want to cover today is this one here. So um, COVID, as we all know, is not something that stops at the boundaries of neighborhoods or counties or anywhere else. It spreads um, like a virus, which means it spreads spatially. And that means that when we report COVID data just at the county level, we're missing some subtlety of how the, the structure of the virus spreads in a place. And so one of the key features of the Atlas is this um, uh, clustering analysis um, using what's known as a method. It's a local 
um, indicator or spatial autocorrelation methods to find hot spots and cold spots for where the virus is spreading. And so these are contiguous regions where there's spatial correlation between the virus and the number of um, um, you know, uh, cases and deaths and everything else in those regions. And I mention this because what we do is we actually compute this in the browser. This is a fairly beefy, fairly like computationally intensive operation to compute these clusters, but we do all of that in the browser in the Atlas using WebAssembly as an example of how you can use it to do some of these things that you would normally have to do on a server, kind of in browser at runtime, um, which is pretty cool. Um, it's really useful as well because we only have one developer on our team, two now since I joined about a year ago, um, but Dylan is the only kind of web developer there and everybody else is kind of looking at kind of the, the research angles and policy angles. But having everything in browser means that we can kind of maintain everything very easily as well. And so it means that for a very small team, we're able to be quite productive and produce like really interesting things. Um, just to give an idea of how this is evolving as well, we're, we're taking the core technology for the Atlas and we're building it out into something called the um, op uh, Opioid Environment Policy Scanner Explorer, which is bringing a lot of data sets together, again, com like compiled into very efficient formats, um, uh, like uh, pro uh, protobuf and uh, GeoParquet formats to be used in the browser by researchers all over the place. So again, they're not inheriting the cost of a system that we're building, they're kind of just using something that is lean and cheap to begin with. Um, this is an example of what that looks like. And we also have other projects like Chives, which uses, again, some WebAssembly in the browser. So this is just to say that for us, um, when we're building these projects out, really what we try to focus on is keeping costs down for people, keeping things maintainable longer term, um, and making this so that it's very easy to package all this in a way that's hostable on a static kind of web server. Um, and what that means is we need client-side analytics, um, uh, or what we kind of think of as an inverted cyber infrastructure. We need to focus on sustainability and extensibility for these projects, and that leads us to focus on um, browser capabilities rather than server capabilities, and that allows us to keep things cheap, lean, and static-ish, um, over like and we prefer that over complicated um, like backend infrastructure. This is kind of what it looks like, as I was saying before, is kind of this idea of we do some backend, we do some scripts-based um, munging of data to get it into a nice format that can be loaded by the browser and used by the browser, and then we use WebAssembly and other techniques to process it in the browser as we go forward. Um, and again, this is kind of like the sort of evolution that a lot of the technology that we built has taken. So let's get it down to it in like WebAssembly. That's kind of like why you might want to use it, and that's why we want to use it, and why we've invested a lot of time into thinking about it and how to actually bring it into these ecosystems. Um, but what is it? I mean, if you've never heard of it before, um, you might think it's about running assembly code on the web, but the name is actually a little bit misleading. It's neither just web nor technically assembly. So it's, it's not a particularly helpful or descriptive name, but it's, it's one that's kind of stuck and is kind of uh, useful. Um, Basically, this is the definition from the, the WebAssembly site. WebAssembly, abbreviated to WASM, is a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine. Um, WASM is designed as a portable compilation target for programming languages, enabling development on the web for client and server applications, which is a lot of words to say that it's a, it's a way of writing, um, compiling code down to a little bite-sized, uh, sorry, a byte chunk of data, like byte code, that is portable and can run in many, many different situations, one of which is a browser. So to dig into that a little bit more, um, WebAssembly itself is not something you would write by hand. You can do it if you want to. There's a WebAssembly text format, which looks like this, um, where you can actually write in the steps for a WebAssembly program. Um, in this case, you can see kind of how it like, resembles um, assembly code, if you've ever written assembly code. Um, we're creating, declaring a module here, we're declaring a function, and then we're pushing parameters on and off a stack um, to create like an add function. So you can write this if you want to. This is like a text-based format for WebAssembly, and that turns into a binary format, which can be run, um, but much more common is um, for us to write a program in another, another language and then compile it down to WebAssembly. So just in the same way as if you're writing C code or you're writing Rust code or other um, like compiled languages, you target them to different um, runtimes. So you target them to say, for example, you know, run on an Apple computer or run on a PC or run on an ARM processor, et cetera. Um, what we can do is we can actually compile these languages down to run as WebAssembly, as a WebAssembly module that runs in a WebAssembly module runtime. And that runtime can be one of many different things as we'll talk about in a second. So the kind of common languages that are used are things like AssemblyScript, which is a variant of TypeScript, which um, compiles down to WebAssembly, which is really nice if you're used to JavaScript and TypeScript. You can get started with it really, really quickly. Um, Rust is a really common one as well because it's got a very lean runtime, so you can compile from Rust to WebAssembly and have particularly lean code, and there's some really good tooling around it that we'll see in a few minutes. Um, Go can also compile down to it and C as well which is really great. So you write a program in any one of these languages and a few other ones, you, ha you basically use some tooling and that creates your WebAssembly binary and that's your WebAssembly chunk of code. 
What you can do with it then is you can take it and run it in lots of different contexts. So the main one we're talking about today is web. So you can take the WebAssembly chunk and run it alongside JavaScript and a browser, um, uh, which means that there's a second language that you can use to run code in a browser now, not just JavaScript, but WebAssembly. Um, all the major browsers support this, which is great. But we can also run it in other places, and this is why I was saying it's not just about web. Um, there's a Postgres extension that you can run um, where you can bring in a, a WebAssembly module and run it as a user-defined function in Postgres. So instead of writing a, a Postgres user-defined function in uh, psql, um, like you can actually write it in WebAssembly and run it in the database. Um, there's some blog posts like looking into this and seeing how, what the speed improvements are, um, but one of the big benefits is there is that you can write your Postgres extensions in other languages, which is really, really nice and really kind of ergonomic. We can also run that WebAssembly binary in other languages. So we can actually take that WebAssembly um, uh, chunk of code and call it from assembly script, call it from Rust, call it from C, call it from Python. So you can write something which compels that into the WebAssembly and then use it in these other languages as a module there. So it kind of gets around this idea that I can write a library in whatever language I want and you can run it in whatever language you want, which is kind of nice as well. And then finally, there are um, WebAssembly runtimes, which allow you to run the WebAssembly code just as like an application on the command line, or in a cloud computing center, or in a cloud edge function. And actually, there's a lot of um, work going in from uh, cloud companies like Cloudflare to um, invest in the WebAssembly um, uh, ecosystem to basically allow people to write these little programs that run very fast on kind of serverless-like functions in the cloud. And so it's a really interesting space and a really interesting time to be involved with this technology, because getting into it means you can get hit all these targets um, pretty easily. To give an example, a concrete example of what it means to write this or write a program that will compile into Rust, this is a really quick example um, of using it using WebAssembly to, sorry, going from Rust to WebAssembly. So Rust has a package called Wasm Bindgen that which allows us to um, really abstract away a lot of the processes that you need to go through to create, go from the Rust code to WebAssembly code. Essentially, we write a Rust function like this one here, add, which just sticks to the numbers and adds them together. We decorate them with Wasm Bindgen. We run a single command, wasm pack build target web, and that produces a package that we can then import into JavaScript and call that function. And so it's pretty straightforward, and there's some good tooling here that allows us to, to write something in Rust or C, et cetera, and then use it in the browser um, and get access to it there, which is pretty cool. Um, so the pros and cons of this, why you might want to do this, and like things to be aware of if you're planning on writing WebAssembly or using WebAssembly, it can be much faster and more reliably faster than JavaScript in a lot of situations. So because it's a binary executed code format, it doesn't need to parse the JavaScript to get to the point where it can run. It can just run as the binary code. Um, if you're writing code in something like Rust, it's non-garbage collected, so you don't have the issues with garbage collection slowing down your processing every so often. Um, it also can be a little bit deceptive with the speed as well. If you've got some really optimized JavaScript, then it can be about the same speed as the, the WebAssembly code, but that's quite hard to, like, it's, you need to be very good at JavaScript to get that performance out. So that's a big, big one. Um, it's also sandboxed. So WebAssembly, when it runs, it runs in its own memory space. Um, so it runs in a, a chunk of memory that JavaScript um, kind of has access to, but kind of doesn't have access to. And so it means it can be quite secure. Um, we only can give, we can give WebAssembly code access to things like the DOM or access to web APIs through some binding code, but you also don't have to do that. So you can have a very isolated piece of code, which means that I can write something and give it to you, and you can run it in a way that's fairly secure and doesn't require you to like, trust me as a, as a writer of that code, which is quite nice. So there's like, security aspect to this as well. And it allows us to bring many existing code bases to the web. So there's many libraries, there's many applications out there, as we'll see in a second, that were written in a language which is not web friendly. But if it can compile to WebAssembly, we can run it on the web, which means that we get this huge library of existing code available to us in the browser. And the caveats are we have to currently write a lot of glue code that can like handle the intersection between JavaScript and WebAssembly. So kind of like talking between the two different languages, there's some code that needs to be written to allow that to happen. Um, I, like uh, things like Wasmpack will do that for you. And there's a couple of like proposals um, like the WebAssembly systems interface, which are going to make that easier in future. Um, Currently, WebAssembly can only accept um, as arguments calling into it very primitive objects, um, basically just U8 arrays. So we have to do some conversion between those going back and forth, which can be costly if you're like going back and forth between JavaScript and WebAssembly. So that's something to note and just think about. And then some libraries can't be compiled to WebAssembly because they rely on things like system features. So if you write something that accesses the um, Linux sy like file system, that doesn't exist when WebAssembly is running in the browser, and so it can, some, it can not compile to that, basically. And it means that you have to be think careful about what you are trying to compile and use in WebAssembly. And it's still pretty young. It's still like an evolving technology, so that's a kind of con caveat as well. Not con, caveat. 
how are people using WebAssembly in the geospace today, like bringing this to the geospatial context? Um, well, there's a couple of, there's three like kind of major modes that I've seen people using it in. The first is compiling existing libraries and applications for the browser, for use in the browser. This is kind of like the, you know, just take something that exists and convert it to the browser, which is uh, pretty cool. Um, there's an example here of um, running GDAL in the browser. So this is um, taking GDAL, which is a C library, compiling it to WebAssembly, and then running it in a browser. So this application here you can go to is um, gdal3.js.org. Um, you can basically go there, um, upload a file of any geospatial format, choose another format to convert it to, hit go, and that will run in your browser on your computer. It's not going up to the server. It's just running right there on your computer in the browser and converting it to whatever format you want using GDAL compiled to WebAssembly, which is pretty cool. So this huge library of geospatial software we have is suddenly now accessible in the browser without having to install anything, without having to worry about Homebrew, without having to worry about AppGet to install GDAL. It's just there in the browser when you go to the URL, which is a huge win if you think about it for teaching, for people like wanting to get into Geo, for wanting to like use it in ways that don't require them to know how to install system level software. It's also a great benefit for people who have sensitive information, um, which is, again, people we often work with and the, the space that we work in. If they've got data which is personally, like, uh, personally identifiable or if it's um, you know, like a privacy concern, then they don't want to be uploading that to a server. They can convert it just in the browser, which is nice. It never leaves their machine, which is pretty cool. So this is kind of like, I like to think about this as like WebAssembly as software delivery. And as I said before, that's how we, we use it in the, the, the um, COVID Atlas. We, we take this library of GDAL, which we've had for years, it's written in C, we compile it to WebAssembly, and then we can call the functions from that and the Atlas, and that's how we do this clustering and that project, which is pretty fun. The second way that we're starting to see WebAssembly being used in the browser are people not just like converting entire projects over to it, uh, to, uh, like, uh, like libraries or projects over to it, but they're compiling entire languages over to the browser as well. So you may have seen um, PyOD or um, uh, Py, thanks, um, Py, um, PyWeb, I think it's called, um, which allow you to run Python in the browser. Um, this is pretty cool. This is an example of using that, and there's a whole bunch of them at pyscripts.net, um, which allow you to kind of run Python code in the browser and do some visualizations and processing with Python in the browser. There are some caveats with that, though. It's great for bringing in existing Python libraries, but not all libraries are available. It's only the ones that are being compiled with that WASM bundle to be used in the browser. So you don't have access to the entire Python ecosystem, just the ones that have been selected to be used in there. And it's pretty hefty. For every app that uses this, we're having to pull down the entire Python -like stack and and sort of, um, call interface. And so it can take about 60 seconds or more to run this and the, the, like, get to the point where something even runs in the browser. The other way people are using it is to create small bits of portable code that are designed to do just what they need them. And this is kind of how we are using it. So this is a project that was done with a, a, an intern of ours um, at the center, uh, Nikhil Patel, who basically wrote a map classification algorithm. So doing kind of like Jenks, um, equal interval, standard deviation classification, um, and Rust that compiles to the WebAssembly, and we can call that in the browser. It's just like a very tiny binary that gives us like these very fast methods for doing map classification in the browser. And so that's kind of how we're thinking about it. Um, where we're using this most, though, is in a platform that we're building out called Matico, which is a, a platform for building geospatial applications entirely in the browser. So allowing us to do this kind of thing we've done with the, the Atlas, et cetera, um, in the browser, but with tools that allow any to do this without writing code, which is, is nice. Um, it's basically a, a, an application that allows you to build applications. Um, you put it up in the browser, and you can add in um, map panes, um, histograms, scatter plots. These can all be interactive with each other. Um, you can pull in data from different sources around the internet, and we load it into the, the browser at uh, runtime. So you can grab GeoJSONs, you can grab CSVs, you can grab GeoParquet files, so they make it really fast and easy. We also have a, a system that will turn any of your data into GeoParquet and host it online. Um, and it allows us to do like some uh, filtering, aggregation, and joins within the browser um, using some WebAssembly to do those processes really fast. Um, but what we're most interested about with it is, and so this is just to say that at the end of this, you can compose these onto like a web application and then serve it um, very cheaply and very easily um, in the browser just using a static web um, um, like uh, idea. The next step of this project is that we're going to bring more complicated analysis to this and allow researchers to write um, chunks of model code and um, analysis code um, into WebAssembly using what we're calling Matico Compute Nodes. These are very simple um, like structures and formats to allow researchers to write reproducible analytic modules, um, starting with Rust. Um, and using them to, with a standard interface to process data in the browser um, so we can just pull anyone in and use it in one of these applications. 
Um, this is kind of how it looks just now. We can define some options that allow us to create an input for this. Not to worry about this too much, we're running out of time a little bit. Um, uh, and then sort of write the code to actually do the application. Um, we were trying to make it as, as clean as possible. And then that can be pulled in. So I, if I, as a researcher working at the center, I can write an algorithm or a processing script, and then somebody else can go to a URL, grab that, and use it in one of these applications all through WebAssembly. Um, we're trying to make this really easy as well, so we're, we're trying to like build in some, some simpler libraries in Rust to make it easier to work with this data and produce these algorithms. So um, Kyle, who's over here and taking a photo, and myself have been working on this um, proof of concept of geopolars, which is a Rust-based library for doing geospatial manipulation, kind of like geopandas, but geopolars, and that's really helping drive these kind of like analyses within WebAssembly and Rust. Um, I'll just skip over this just now. So in summary, like, we think that this is a really great approach for working with people who don't have a lot of resources, like we do. And um, we're trying to build out tools that allow them to do very like, concentrated compute in the browser using WebAssembly. We're trying to make those computes portable using WebAssembly and safe to be portable. And then we're also trying to build out these kind of like, like toolings around this to make it so that I can use tools like code that you used and me as well. So I think WebAssembly is a really interesting like, technology for the geospace. It's still pretty young. There's a lot of experimentation going on, but it really does mean that there could be a time when we can run an entire like QGIS like stack in the browser at almost near native speeds um, without any installation or any kind of worry um, for how people are going to use it. And that's my talk, and I'll be open to any questions.